Lord, we stand in thy presence, Lord. I believe I stand for people committed to walking in thy presence. I pray that you bless them, O oh God, and that you would give them an ear to hear. Lord, we, we understand, Lord, that English isn't the primary language. But Lord, it's beyond words, Lord. It's, it's thy spirit that will take a thought and express it to the people. So I pray, Lord, that you give me the ability, Lord, to express these things in a simple manner and that thy people will receive of me. I ask your blessings and I give you thanks in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We can uh, all be seated. We are going to uh, continue on a message about the vision uh, for revival. And uh, the other night, we started going through points and really asking ourselves, is this something that I need or something that I would desire? And we just touched three and we'll try to get four tonight. The number one was a, a closer walk with him. Number two was a call to repentance. And number three was a deeper prayer life. There are some words we have to understand to really understand what I'm looking at tonight. Uh, the words are uh, righteousness and sanctification and holiness. And what we have to understand is that there are really um, two kinds of every one of these words. There is, a, there is a dimension like this and there is a dimension like this. See, we, we, we find out when God talks about love, He talks about that. Is that we have to love God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. That is this dimension. But then there is this dimension that you must love your brother even if you love yourself. The same thing with righteousness and sanctification and holiness. When we come to the Lord, He cleanses us and He makes us Justified. He sanctifies us. He, he makes us holy, and this is fully just the word of God. If you are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason you can receive the Holy Ghost as soon as you come out of the water, because you come out of that water completely clean. Amen? Amen. But then there is also this dimension, and it speaks about the way we walk, walk in this world. Because God can sanctify us. He can declare that we are holy. But then there is a walk that he would ask of us. And this is, comes by, not in a moment, but it comes by a process. As we start to learn his will and his purpose, and we are start to be transformed into his image. That we start to understand what would please Him. That we start to have Christ formed in us. I've got a question. If, if anybody want revival? Amen? Well, there's a couple of us do. But if we desire that, and it's going to cost us something, if it's going to cause us to repent and, and cry out to God, would we still want that? See, I, I think this isn't just for the old or the young or the preachers. or It's really for every one of us. Um, and I pray but you can see what I'm looking at tonight. If we go to the next slide, the fourth part, uh, humility and true holiness. Not just an outward show, but true holiness. Charles Spurgeon said this, if we want revival, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. 
At Azusa Street, I, I read this testimony, and, and it, it often struck my heart. It says, people refrained from greeting one another when they came inside. Instead, they quietly bowed to acknowledge God's presence. As the service began to wind down, I realized it was past midnight. I had been at the mission for 10 hours. You know, it was mentioned this morning, in His presence is fullness of joy. That's true. But God is more than just one dimensional. Sometimes in His presence, and I thought about tonight as the song service started, it was different. It was more maybe quiet. I mean, I, I hope you can still recognize God. Amen? It says this, like most of those who come, we arrive by streetcar. We shall talk on the way home tonight, but now we have been holding our hearts steady in silent preparation for God's moving during the day. We have, forgot, we have not forgotten the Spirit's exaltation of the night before. Prepare yourselves in outward silence, for it favors an inward silence and promotes interior, interior spiritual rest. See, we, we, we live in a noisy world. We are connected. We're, we've got phones and tablets and devices and, and earphones, and, and, and we've got all these things to completely uh, saturate our mind with someone else's thoughts. And we lose the um, the treasure that we are given of quietness before God. To listen to His Said this, it is a pause from natural activity, a resting in the perfect will of God. The Holy Spirit is calling the people to this interior stillness that they may have a deeper understanding of the mystery of God in Christ now being revealed, and to know the signs of the times as they go forth at His call. In Bloomington, there have been times I would would ask the people, you know, let's come into service and and honor God. Let's not be late. Let's, let's come in and, and quiet ourselves down that when the service begins, we will be ready. And when I exhorted the people to do that, you know what they do? They, 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 some people, I, I've heard this, Brother Tim, you're trying to put in church order. That's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to prepare myself to enter into the Holy of Holies. And then I would see people would do this, and then you know what? The presence of God would just pour down on the service. And it would be like that for a couple weeks, but then you know what happens? They go back to sitting in the fellowship hall drinking coffee and running in at the last minute. Because we have a hard time Breaking old habits. You know, they said at Azusa Street there was um, there was no worry about things getting out of control because God was in control. He brought about an order, a sense of His holiness. Now He used men. They said sometimes William Seymour would be on the floor above where they were having services, and if somebody got a little out of out of line, they would hear it. Because up there he could sense that something had entered in that was not the Spirit of God. See, we can trust God. And what they recognize at Azusa Street is God can use anyone. Young and old, there were young people that saw tremendous miracles. You know, it, it wasn't that you had to have the pastor lay his hands on you. It might just be a young sister.
sister would lay her hands on a blind person and her eyes would be open. And Brother Strong, I believe that's what God wants to do again. Brother Keith, we was talking about that. He wants to use everyone. And at uh, Azusa Street, that anointing would, would come in and everybody in the building would be speaking, I would be singing in tongues. I have enjoyed the worship and the singing, but I think this Lord, I would like to experience that. I think if that anointing came, even I could seem good. You know, it would be, uh, when I hear it, I think, Lord, I want that. I remember I was up in, in Canada, and, and we had, they had a worship service, Brother Conley's church. And my, it was amazing. And I walked out, and Brother Conley said, he was almost there. I said, what? He said, there is a place that you enter in that's beyond what you usually come into. And I thought, keep, I thought, oh my, if this was this glorious, what is it like to take that next step right. into that realm right. where we are completely lost in the Shekinah glory of God as he engulfs his people? Says this revival awakens in our hearts an increased awareness of the presence of God, a new love for God, a new hatred for sin, and a hunger for His Word. Amen. It's not just it's not just the emotion and the excitement and the miracles and things. It is His Word because that's Him, and to know Him, I want to know. What he says. I, I love Brother Stroman's testimony, and you probably many of you heard this. That when him and Grace were young, they were at a Bible college, and um, the Lord started to move. And his testimony was, you know what? That Bible college didn't even believe in personal holiness as far as the way you dress. But when the presence of God came, it changed the way they presented themselves. Amen? Oh my. Why? Because he's a holy God. I remember this. I used to, in 1988, I moved closer down to Jeffersonville, and I could start to go to Faith Assembly every Thursday night. I did that for about 14, 15 years. And I used to remember this. Brother Jackson, he didn't preach on Thursday night, but when you got close to the convention, Brother Jackson would take a Thursday night, and you know what he'd do? Young people. We're going to have a lot of visitors. Would you wash your face? Would you put on decent clothes? You're representing something. But about 1994, the anointing came in, and Brother Jackson didn't have to give that message. Because the young people recognized we want to present ourselves in a way that will honor God. Amen. I believe he's still able to do that. We had a service in Bloomington, and um, there was a, some visitors from another church, and this good brother, godly man, had been walking with God many years, living a close life. And he said, as you preached, it was like an arrow struck my heart. He says, I saw the holiness of And then he said, I was so ashamed of myself, I could not even lift my head. And people can ask this question for, why would God do that? Some would say, maybe that's not God. 
Maybe that's the adversary trying to make me feel bad. The accuser of the brethren. And we can ask the question, well, well why would why would I feel ashamed when I'm covered by the blood? Amen? Because if we're covered by the blood, then all our sins and transgressions are under the blood. But I thought about that. There's reasons that God would allow this. And I will say this. If you experience that, count yourself fortunate. Number one, it is to deepen our awareness of the holiness of God. This is what it says in Acts 7.32, that Moses trembled and durst not be holy. Brother Stroman said, you know, I want to be like Moses. Moses was a great man. But to come into the presence of God. Oh my. He was a vessel that God was going to use It is to purge out of us all self-righteousness. See, God, that, that stinks in his sight. When we start to believe that, you know what, I, I think this, we can, de we can declare we are the bride of Christ. We are overcomers. But when we boast in ourselves, The reality of it is, I am but dust and ashes. Listen to Daniel chapter 10 and verse 8. I'll tell you, Daniel is a godly man. No one quite like him in that hour. We talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are good men. I think Daniel. And this is what he says. Therefore, Daniel 10, 8, I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turning me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Amen. The beauty, the, the strength, the, the, you know, he was exalted in the kingdom. But when he came into that presence, he said, all my beauty seemed as corruption. And I want to ask you this. Anybody want to experience that? It doesn't sound pleasant. Amen. I think this, it will transform a man's life. It is to bring humility into our life. It changes the way we look at our brothers and sisters. It changes the way we look at the world. I told a couple of these stories on Sunday, I think it was, last week. Brother Branham, he, he, he went into a cafe one time and and he looked over and he saw this woman and, and a couple of men and they're drinking and they're carrying on and stuff. And, and Brother Branham said, Lord, I don't know why you don't just destroy those people. And then he sees a, a vision. He sees the earth and he sees a circle of blood around it. And God says, if it wasn't for that, I would have to destroy you. Yeah. See, sometimes we forget that. Amen? I, I told this, I, the, the brother that baptized me, he, he told this story. He, he went to a, a gospel scene. And he said he's sitting there and he said this woman come walking in and he says, oh, she was dressed terrible. Clothes weren't decent. She had makeup all over her face. And he said, I, I leaned back in my chair and he said, I thought, Lord, they ought not to even allow people like that in this building. He said then that the, the guy leading the song service said, we're going to have an altar call. Does anybody need Jesus? And he said that woman ran to the altar, tears pouring down her face. And he said as I leaned back in my chair, I thought, Lord, they ought not to 
not to allow people like me in here. Hey, sometimes we need that we forget. I had an experience a few months ago. I was, I was watching a movie about the Holocaust, and it portrayed the Nazis and how dark and evil they were. And, 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 and I thought, Lord, those men were disgusting. And then the presence of God came into that room. And all of a sudden I saw myself before he applied his grace to my life. Oh, I was disgusting. You know, I had to turn off the show. It took me a while to be able to shake that feeling of disgust. See, the best of us were sinners. See, we sing this song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Do you really understand what you're saying? I had no righteousness that God should show favor to me. Yet he did. See, it, it, it made me thankful to realize that I was so wretched. When I saw sin in the light of God's holiness, I detested sin, transgressions, disobedience. I want to flee from those things. See, what made Jesus cry, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. You know what? Jesus wasn't the first guy to get crucified. That wasn't it. He was going to have my sin poured upon him. And you know what? He was going to feel the consequences Separation from God. No wonder he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because when he became sin for us, God pulled back his presence. Why would you want to indulge in something that is so dark and terrible that Jesus himself wept? Terribly thinking what would it be like to find myself in that position. If we go to the, the next slide, I was sent a video. I never did watch the video, but the title caught my attention. And it said this, how did we turn worship into singing? See, if, if I would ask you, what, what is worship? And many, our minds would go to a song service. We, we talk about a, a worship team. And there's an exhortation to worship God. But you know, the word that is translated worship in the King James Version is not always translated worship. You want know to translate it at other times? Bow down. It is to submit yourself unto someone greater. Amen? It is to recognize His glory I, I thought this this week the, the statement was made Let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord And um, That is absolutely the truth Everything that is alive Can give thanks to God Amen? Because He is the source of all life, 
all, all good things come from Him. But then I thought this. Not everyone can worship. Because it's more than a song. It is a life submitted to God. Amen? Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. It is worship. The music can be an expression. And a lot of people can sing. But if your life is not Submit it to God. Will he accept it? If we go to the, the next slide. He told the woman at the well. You know she had a revelation. Messiah's coming. But he said she worshipped. And no not watch. I read this. It says true worship will always be a mark of a genuine revival. If there is a revival, there is going to be worship and there's going to be singing and rejoicing and, and, and bowing down and, and but there will be lives brought in subjection to Him. As the presence of the Lord is experienced by His people, worship will be the natural response of those whose hearts are set on God. Let me tell you this. It is not true worship if it is not in spirit and in truth. Because he said if we're going to worship him, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the matter ram. A life lived in obedience to God brings a greater honor than the most skilled musicians, the most beautiful voices. Amen. I tell you, I cannot sing well. I can sing, but not well. But I think God would rather hear, and I'm not saying He wants me up here singing. That's not the point. But He would rather hear someone glorifying that really glorifies Him. See, it is not true worship if it comes from a life lived in disobedience before God. And I'm not talking like Brother Keith said, we all make mistakes. There is a big difference between making a mistake and just living in disobedience to what you know is the truth. Amen. What God would require. Listen to this in Amos chapter 5 and verse 4. I'm thinking a lot of churches would not want to hear something like this. And I'm not saying it applies to here. But I'm telling you, it, this is applicable in our day and hour. Amos 5, 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. That's a great promise. But then listen to verse 10. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. They don't want anybody to tell them how to live. They don't want anybody to tell them what's acceptable. They want to be Lord of their own lives. And then listen to this. This is God speaking. I hate, I despise your feast days. Amen. Well, isn't that honoring God? 
only in form. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. In other words, they, 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 they create a sacrifice, and the incense rises up, and God says, I don't not receive it. You, you, you understand this, that, that if what he's saying here, because it's our, it's our prayers, our, our worship, it, it can ascend up into heaven like incense. I believe this, this week that Brother Elevera, that he smelled a sweet savor. No doubt about it. But I will tell you this, if your heart's far from God, it only goes to the ceiling and will never ascend into heaven. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Then he says this, in verse 23, Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. You know what? That's something, isn't it? What he says, the only thing I'm hearing from your music is a bunch of noise. Why? Because it is the heart that is producing these things. He said, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years of the O house of Israel. Brother Stroman mentioned this. But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and tuned your images, the stars of your God which you made to yourself. Oh my. You know what he's saying? You have a divided heart. You, you come before me and you worship and you sing songs and it sounds so beautiful, but to me it's empty. Because in your back pocket is your I Amen? In Joel chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and a great kindness and repentance him of the evil. See, we can't worship God with a divided heart. He tells us, love not the world or the things of this world, because if you do, love of the Father is not in you. He wants us to be fully giving more our heart. See, I think sometimes people don't realize this. In Exodus chapter 32, you all know the story about Aaron and the golden calf. And he builds this golden calf. And he builds an altar. And he makes a proclamation, we're going to have a feast day. And in the King James Version, it says, These are your God, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. But you know what? I think in the original it actually says, This is Elohim that brought you out of Egypt. See, he wasn't pointing them to the gods of Canaan or even the gods of Egypt. But he had made an image and he said, this is Elohim. And they had a feast and they started, they started worshiping. Hey, the God was far from it.
And Joshua heard it up in the mountain. He thought, oh, it sounds like there's a war going on. It was noisy. And um, he said, Moses, but that's not what that noise is. It's singing. It's dancing. Oh my, I tell you, it's good to sing. It's good to dance. If it's before the Lord. Amen. This is what he said. I hear the noise, but it's only noise. The hearts are yielded to me. See, there, there is a tremendous power in music. A power for good, a power for bad. There is an ability to excite your emotions. Like Brother Oliver says, emotions are okay. If they're in tune with God, but it has the ability to excite the emotions. But where's your heart at? Let me tell you this. You ever read what it was like as they worshipped Baal? The music would come to a fever pit. I mean, it was so loud. And some people think, well, if, if it's loud, then God must be in it. But, but you know why they, I mean, they would, the drums and the cymbals, and, and I'm not talking against drums and cymbals, if you understand this. But you know what, it would become so loud because they would have an idol made of brass and, and they would kindle a fire in it. And what they would do is they would bring their babies up and lay their babies in the arms of this idol and roast them alive. You know what the music was for? The noise to deafen the sound of the babies crying, screaming as they're sacrificed to God. And that's why some people like the noise and the excitement because you know what? In the noise and the excitement, it drains out the burden of my sin. I don't have to face that. I tell you, and I, I, you know, somebody can go, somebody can leave and say, "Oh, brother Tim said we ought not to have loud music," and we ought. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is our heart has to be in tune with God. Amen? Amen. If we go to the next slide, what is the purpose of revival, a move of God? It is to awaken hearts that have fallen asleep. See, it's easy to become comfortable. I was talking to Brother Keith and he mentioned something. He said, you know, people, they want to just sit in their comfort zone. They don't want to see God do nothing. And he said, you know, Brother Jackson told him, he said, you know what, they have no desire to see anybody sit. They don't care. They're safe. See, the Bible says this, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall walk to wax cold. Do you know what that means? This world is so dark and so cold that if we're not careful, it will have an effect upon us. Amen? See, there is a spirit of this age that we have to be alert to because if we don't, it will overcome us. See, revival is to remind us of who we are and where we came from. See, sometimes after we've been walking with the Lord 
For 30 years, we just tend to forget. We tend to lose the fire and the passion, and, and uh, we don't need to do that. It's good to go back and remember what it was like to feel the burden of sin. But you know what? It's glorious to remember when it was lifted. Oh man, I remember that. When I come up out of the water and I knew. I've seen, seen people, we baptize people and they told me afterwards, my I felt so clean. Oh my. We, don't, we can't forget these things. There was a sister come to church and, and, and she, she had carried this burden for years and years. She had been abused as a young child. And we, we anointed her with oil and prayed for her. And she said it was like the burden just completely went away. I was completely delivered. And then she said, can you tell me where I can buy some of that hot oil at? says this, revival, work of God by His Spirit through His Word, bringing the spiritually dead to the living faith in Christ and renewing the inner life of Christians who have grown slack and sleepy. Amen. Anybody ever been there? Amen. Now we're talking to the older ones. Have you ever come to a point where, um, be honest with yourself, I've lost my passion. I've lost my drive, but you know what? we just going through the motions. And you know it's not acceptable to God, but it's hard to rise up out of that. We need, a, we need something that will spark that within us. Amen. Begins in us. See, you can see it all around us, but we need something in us. It says this, the word revival means making alive again those who have been alive and have fallen into what is called a cold or dead state. They are Christians and have life, but need reviving to bring them back to their first love. See, that's what he told even the early church. They had such a glory of God, power and signs and wonders, but then Jesus looks and he said, you lost something. It's your first love. What you had at the very beginning. Hey, I want to tell you tonight that if anybody here has done that, has allowed the things of this world to creep in, because it says the things of this world will choke. Amen. I will tell you tonight, he's able. Maybe I shouldn't even use that word revival because it's been corrupted so much. But he's able to restore your first love. He's able to rekindle the fire. Whereas it's not a burden to walk with God. You don't have to challenge people to come to church. There's a longing, right. not only to be in the house of God, but to enter in His gates with thanksgiving and praise, to be with your brothers and sisters, right. to lay aside the things of this world. When the church as a whole, its ministers and members, is not living in full, wholehearted devotion to Christ and His servant, is not walking in the joy of the Lord and separation from the world, we need to pray more than for the conversion of the unconverted, that God's peoples may be truly revived and have the life of God and the power restored to them. See, some people think, well, revival is about bringing people in. But you know what? If you bring people into a cold, lifeless church, 
It won't be long that we just like you. See, if God wants to bring people in here, and I believe that, He gives you a big building. God wants to bring people in, touch their hearts, but what are they going to see when they come in here? If they see a people on fire for God, it'll naturally compel them to come higher. But if they hear a lot of murmuring in the tents, that's what they'll be also. I like this. It says, study the history of revival. God has always sent revival in the darkest days. Oh, for a mighty sweeping revival today. If that's what it takes to bring revival to darkness, we are prime candidates for revival. God's time for revival is the very darkest hour when everything seems hopeless. It is always the Lord's way to go to the very worst cases to manifest His glory. See, Brother Branham, he saw the church ages and he said, this is darker than the dark ages. See, if we, if we want more of God, we'll take a deeper commitment. <laughs> If I desire change, I need to change. Amen? You want better messages? Saturday night, instead of watching TV, fall on your knees and pray for the pastor. See, the, the, our, our, our time devoted to the things of this world is able to suck the life out of us. I, I, I probably told this story before. Years ago, I, I got a treadmill because I thought I could maybe lose some weight, get in shape. And I got on this treadmill, and, and, and I, I forget how long I was on the treadmill. And then I'm thirsty. And I went to the refrigerator and I and, and, and I'll say this, on the treadmill, it told me how many calories I burned. And I thought, you know, you burn calories, you lose weight, and I read it and I lost this many calories. I went to the refrigerator and I got out of Mountain Dew. <laughs> and I spun the can around and it told me how many calories it had in it. The same amount I just burned. <laughs> And I thought this, all that effort is down the drain when I drink this. I thought, I'll drink some water. <laughs> see, see the, the reality of it, you can come into church and you can feel the presence of God and you can feel Him pulling and you can come for prayer and you can ask, say, God, I want to get close to you. But then the decisions you make when you leave this place have the potential to suck what you got right out of your life. See, anybody ever have a big meal and what you want to do afterwards is take a nap? Because digestion takes energy. See, you feel yourself up with the things of this world and don't be surprised that it makes you spiritually sluggish. That you're not on fire, you just want to lay down and get comfortable. Says this, a, a, a true revival means nothing less than a revolution casting out the spirit of worldliness and selfishness and making God and His love triumph in the heart and life. I like this. It says, Contentment with earthly goods is the mark of a saint. Contentment with our spiritual state is the mark of inward blindness. Christianity has fallen to its present low state from a lack of spiritual hunger. 
Among the many who profess the Christian faith, scarcely one in a thousand reveal any passionate thirst for God. I don't believe that's here. But that's what it's like in the world. If we go to the next slide, it is to uh, cleanse the church from carnality. To remove bickering and murmuring and complaining. I heard this one time. They asked Billy Paul Branham, what is the uh, greatest miracle you ever seen in the life of your dad? You know what he said? And I'm thinking this, Mike, he's seen a lot of things. He said, you could not tell by the way he treated people, whether they were his friend or his enemy. Oh my, that's quite a testimony. <coughs> See, the Bible tells us that all the law is fulfilled in one word. Amen? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, there's some churches teaching now that your neighbor is only the guy sitting next to you. Guy out there in the world. How are you going to treat him? Listen to this woman's testimony I share with you. I bless and praise God that the Holy Ghost fell in near Los Angeles. Oh, and it took me in. Oh, how hungry I was, and how the glory of heaven flooded my soul as I sat and listened to dear Brother Seymour expound the Word of God. This is that which the prophet Joel said should come. Glory to his holy name. It's come. It's in my innermost being and abiding there. Oh, the glory of the anointing that abideth. It's clean hands and pure hearts. And a walk blameless before God in holiness. Amen. Let me read that again. In the midst of all these powerful miracles, Clean hands and pure hearts and a walk blameless before God in holiness and fear, meditating day and night in the law of God that keep this wonderful anointing. Few will pay the price to get that as Joel said should come. And few will continue to pay the price to keep it. But by His grace and power, I mean to keep it if all hell should shake and conspire to make me fall or step for one moment aside. I've taken the narrow way. Oh, I love it. I mean to go through with the despised few. Oh, how I love Jesus. I never loved him as I do now. His word never was so sweet. It's my meat and drink day and night. How can I ever praise him enough or do enough or suffer enough for what he's done for me? What a privilege to suffer a little with Jesus. This awful power and prince of the air is our worst enemy. We don't fight against flesh and blood. This is a greater fight, and with a greater fight comes far greater power. For every 99 pounds of trial comes 100 pounds of grace. How it thrills my heart to think of the dear blessed saints that are standing true. As never before we are going to see the mighty signs falling, the preaching of the word. As we keep in line with this truth and in no way compromise, preach the word and let the Holy Ghost magnify Jesus Glory, glory to his precious name. How my very soul is thrilled with the thought of what God is going to do through a clean people. Amen. Amen. That was what he said. I think, Lord, if you're going to clean us up, what will you do once we're clean? Right. Amen. Oh, my. I want that. Amen. I want that. Oh, I want to be spotless and have every thought brought into subjection. This gospel is going like wildfire. It shall sweep everywhere, everything before it, compromisers and all. The blessed Lord has let us see a little ahead to encourage our hearts while the fight is on. The blessed Jesus is so precious to me. Amid evil reports and great demands for help, 
He gives such assurance in my poor soul that all is well. All the calm is coming after the storm. Then it said this, I have never known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. Amen. When you don't love one another, We go to the next slide. Ah, Brother Keith, the kingdom of God is within you. It's to transform our lives, and in that transformation, it's to draw the lost. I would ask you this question. If the kingdom has come, should it not be expressed? Now, it says the kingdom cometh not with observation, but I think this, when the kingdom comes, it will be observable. I should be able to tell Who's ruling with your life? I think about this. Brother Keith said he's going to make, make, if it gets to this point, talk about a millennium kingdom. And it says this, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy kingdom. What kind of people is that? Listen to Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. I understand this is the millennium. But the kingdom of God is within us now. Amen? And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his path, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. Wait a minute. I don't want law. I want grace. Hey, what's he talking about? It's instructions and righteousness. That there will be a hunger in people that I want to know what pleases God. Anybody here want to know what will please God? Oh, Brother Tim, if I don't know Brother Stroman, then I'm not responsible. And, 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 and really, I want to do what I want to do, and I just want His grace to be multiplied. But in that kingdom, it says they're going to say, Brother, I, I want to know. When you, when you preach a message, they're not going to become angry, and, and they're not going to leave and tell their brother and sister, I didn't believe that. He doesn't have any business getting into my life. They'll say, let us go and let us learn of God what will please Him. Amen. And listen to this. He shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. You know what a sword is? It's to kill someone. You know what a plowshare is? It's to feed someone. And he said it's going to be transformed. And their spears and the pruning hooks. Anybody want to have their life transformed where you're helping people instead of hurting people? Right. Listen to this, Psalm 64, 3. Who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. It's, it's the words we're speaking. It's destroying people. And you know what it is? It's the kingdom of darkness. But he says, 
I will change this. That your words won't tear down and they won't hurt and you won't gossip and you won't murmur and you won't complain. But the things that you say will be a will be an encouragement to one another that will lift up your brother and sister and strengthen them on their journey. How about this? Proverbs 12, 18. There is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Amen. Oh, we claim to be the wise virgins, but are we walking in wisdom? Or are we just justifying it? You know, wise virgin isn't a title. It is a description of a walk before God. See, your life is a reflection of who is upon your heart. Who, who's on the throne of your heart? Joshua 3 and verse 5. Joshua meets, maybe. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Brother Oliveri said there's more tomorrow. going to be more tomorrow. He said, sanctify yourself. Make preparations. Amen? Amen. You know, we mentioned this when we was all shouting and rejoicing. God was here. It is quiet in here right now. I think this God is here. How precious that he would think to ask you, come up higher. Come dwell where I do. Be broken. Amen? Like the vessels of Gideon. Be broken. Be humble. Be honest. Believe that there is more for us. There's more for me than I've ever experienced before. I think about this. Brother Stroman, you have had a lot of experiences. I've listened to him and I've rejoiced. I think this. There's a reason you're still here. There's a reason. Many at your age have sat down in their recliner. But there's something pulling Not just to relive past experiences. And, and, and I think that's important. To remember 
Like Brother Stroman tells me sometimes, there's some things that they're just there, you could never deny them. No. There must be a reason He's keeping me on the road. He's keeping me healthy. How healthy? Oh my. Sometimes you go with a bad leg. But healthy enough to go no doubt the devil said, oh, this will slow him down. And I like what he said. There's nothing wrong with my voice. See, if, if, we, if we can believe that he has more for us. See, when you taste God's glory, puts a hunger within you to experience more. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, and we will uh, try to close this up. You know, as yeah, Joel chapter 2. While you're turning there, I, I, I just thought of this, this uh, story. There was a, um, I think it was at Lucy Street. There was a man that was visiting, and, and he was from uh, India. He was a Hindu. Do you, you ever read the stories? That anointing was so strong. It spread out for blocks. Sometimes the people would get off the train and they'd fall down on the platform speaking in tongues. <laughs> That's something. Fall under conviction. You know, how far can His glory radiate from this place? Speak to people's hearts. So this Hindu man, he said he didn't know how it happened, but he ended up finding himself in the Zuzu Street Mission. And a little girl, just a little girl, stepped up on the bench and started speaking in tongues. And they didn't all realize that she was speaking his language. It says she told him about his life, named his sins, and told him Jesus is the Savior. Oh my. And some people say, oh, those, those little kids, they have no part. Joel chapter 2 and verse 13 and rend your heart and not your garments. You know what he's saying? I don't want an outward show. That's not what I'm looking for. It may look good to the pastor or the people in the church, but that's not what I'm looking for. I want to see your heart broken for me. And turn unto the Lord your God. Isn't that the Elijah message? Turn your hearts back to God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. An inward turning to seek and search after God. In verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old man shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days 
before I pour out my spirit. You know what? Peter quoted that. This is that that the prophet spoke of. But do we check? That's done. Or do we leave it open? Leave it. It's not complete. You understand what I'm saying? That Today, we should make preparations that our sons and daughters should prophesy. Your old man, oh, I'll look forward to that when I get old. So dream dreams. Your young man, Jared, see visions. We're walking around you've never experienced before. And upon servants and upon the handmaids of those days will I sprinkle out my spirit. Hey, that's not what it says. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit. This is why we need to be brought into the presence of God and understand our wretchedness that we can see His glory. And there'll never be competition among that kind of people. I can rejoice when God uses you. Amen. Well, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I pray that we can all worship God. Amen. That we can live a life that declares Thou art Lord. That my life will honor Him. when uh, we begin to sing that the music will go beyond the building. That it will send them to heaven. If you cannot worship with a divided heart and you cannot worship in disobedience unto God do you know what I would say? change simple enough change cry out God have mercy on me And he can change the fragrance, the fragrance of our work.
worship for from a stench to a sweet aroma. My Pastor June, you smell good. Well, <laughs> to him, I believe you do. That's what I believe. About this, I was thinking this this afternoon. You, you want to see a worship team? Look at Sister Grace and Sister Anna. It's a worship team because you want to, You know what I see? Lives submitted unto God. And when 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 Judah Band starts to to sing and, and, and you feel lifted up. And want to join into with him. I think it's the same thing. You see a couple sisters and they're walking humbly and, and properly before God. They ought to do something to the young girls and say, I want to possess that. Man. Because in God's sight, oh my, powerful. I think Brother Stroman said, said one time, Sister Grace preaches everywhere we go. Not taking a Bible and exhorting the people, but walking humbly before God, supporting her husband, and really living a life that the world doesn't see much of anymore. Okay. And that is worship. Spirit and truth. Want to stand with me? Amen. Well, we can ask it again. Is anyone, as we look to the Lord, just want to say, Lord, search me. Search me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for your presence. Thankful for your word, Lord, your instructions in righteousness. Lord, what a people I stand before. Lord, even as I, I ask the question, how do you preach revival to the people on fire? But Lord, I believe and I have delivered what you placed upon my heart. And I believe that there's value here, Lord, and how people can receive it. So bless us this night, O oh God, and, and Lord, I look forward to what you'll do tomorrow. For thou art a fountain of, of living water. And I believe these brothers that are standing with me, Lord, they're called and chosen of thee, Lord, and that thou are able to hear thy voice and to share with thy people, Lord, to better understand Jesus or walk before thee. Bless thy people, Lord, and I give thee thanks. I count myself unworthy in myself, the Lord, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you granted this access to a spiritual dimension. I have them now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and I thank you. Thank you, Lord.
shall be like the balls before the, the altar. I will speak in our language now, if you bear with me. Alam niyo mga kapatid, huwag po magagalit yung mga kapapanihan. Marami tayong mga sisters, hindi na namumuhay ng may kapanahan. Yung ating panlabas na anyo, mukha na tayong tagasanlibutan. Mas kinagaya natin yung fashion ng mundo, natatakot tayong magpresenta ng ating sarili ng maayos, at modest sa harapan ng Panginoon. Yung mga sisters na matatanda sa pananampalataya, instead na maging holy, naging worldly. Totoo, hindi ba? Tapos yung mga kabataan, sino tinitignan nila? Yung mga sisters, di ba? Paano sila kukuha ng halimbawa ng kabalanan kung yung mga sisters na supposed to be maging halimbawa ng kabalanan ay naging loose na po. No? Puno ng makeup, puro alahas, hindi na namuhay ng simple sa Panginoon. Hindi po tayo tagasanlibutan, mga kapatid. Amen po. Amen po. Kahit hindi naman kayo mag-amen, amen ng mga. Yun po yung dapat nating salaminin kung tayo pa, bago tayo magsimba. At sana hindi lang dito sa church. We're not supposed to present ourselves modest only when we are in the confines of this building. Because we're not putting up a show. It is what you are outside. Mas gusto nating maging modelo yung mga artista, mga Hollywood actor, Sura nila yung naginagaya natin. Imbis na gayahin natin yung mga tao sa Biblia. Tapos gusto natin pagpasok sa simahan, puspusin tayo ng Diyos. Paano tayo pupuspusin ng Diyos kung malayo ang puso natin sa Kanya? Ang sabi ng Panginoon, these people, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Yeah. Hindi naman tayo pwedeng magsinungaling sa Panginoon hindi natin siya pwedeng lukuhin. Yung tao, pwede mong lukuhin, pero ang Diyos hindi. Mga kapatid. So, mga kapatid lang ng mga kapagayin, huwag tayong matakot na maging banal sa harap ng Panginoon. Talo pa tayo ng mga Muslim. Di ba? Di ba yung mga Muslim na babae, hindi sila rin katakot magbihis ng banal. Mali naman yun, di ba? Mali na paniniwala yun. Bakit tayo na nag-aangkil, nakasintahan ni Kristo, takot na takot tayo na ma-identify no? sa kabanalan ng Panginoon? Samantalang yan ang tawag ng Diyos sa atin. If you would read in Ephesians chapter 1, the purpose of predestination is this. Let me read to you verse chapter 1 verse 4. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be, holy and without blame before Him in love. God is holy and they that walk with Him should walk in holiness. And the Bible says without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Amen po. Yun ang kailangan kumalik sa simbahan yung kabanalan ng Panginoon. Dahil ang kapanalan, dadaling ka sa pakumsa sa iyong minuti. Amen? Panawagan din sa mga asawa ng pastor. Amen po. Nawa maging halimbawa kayo ng kapanalan. Sa inyong mga nasasakupan. Huwag po kayo maging halimbawa ng worldliness. Maging halimbawa kayo ng kapanalan. Kayo ang nanay ng simbahan. Amen po. Tinitignan kayo ng mga tao ninyo, mga kapatid. Mahirap maging asawa ng pastor. Pero binigyan tayo ng mga nauna na pwede nating gayahin. Kung nakaya nila, kayo ninyo sa tulong ng Panginoon. Alam ninyo kung papasok tayo sa simbahan na punong-punong tayo ng paggalang, pagrespeto, pagpapakumbaba, 
at nanginis na puso sa Panginoon. Mga kapatid, hindi pa tumutunog yung mga instrumento, mararamdaman mo na yung presensya ng Panginoon. Pwede kaya nabasa ko yung post mo bago ka pumunta dito. Anong sabi mo sa post mo? That's, I really like that. Let this convention be an avenue of transformation. I like that. Hindi ka pumunta dito and you want to be the same person again. Yes. I want to be changed. Because by the way, testified that we were talking before we fetched the met the, the weeks last uh, uh, last week because of what they went through. You know what he told me? Because we haven't seen them for quite some time as well. He said, Pastor, you know, because of the sickness that have been going our family, my wife is sick, my son is sick, and it cost us a lot of money. It really drained even not only our wallet, but our spiritual strength as well. So who among us is not vulnerable to being in that condition? We can also lose the fire, we can get burned out, we can reach the breaking point. You want to just throw in the towel and say, I'm done. But in your heart, you say, Lord, like Samson said, just once more. If there's anyone here, you think you've lost the fire. Hey, let that this night pass without you being touched. Truly touched by the Almighty God. I only need a pianist right now. Just a pianist. I will sing and you know there are so many expressions of God. He can be in an earthquake, a fire, a whirlwind, but he can also be in a still small voice. Amen. Hey, God is not against noise. It says in the book of Psalm, make a loud noise. But sometimes it's not always noise. Sometimes it's good to be. Stillness. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. So anyone here that wants the touch of God, oh, don't miss this opportunity.